Good morning, everyone. We're continuing on with our conversation about money magnetism. So let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Baba J. Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master Paramhansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, humbly we bow to you all. Dear Swamiji, guide our thinking and our feeling that we may understand the wisdom of what you are sharing with us about money and how to attract it, how to live secure in this world, how to carry forth with the assignments that we've been given, and above all, how to change our consciousness so that in the end, when this incarnation is done, we may look back with gratitude for your guidance and satisfaction in our ability to receive, and that we may go forth into new adventures, having learned well the lessons you would have us learn. Om. Peace. Amen. I have to realize in the context of this whole class, you know, I I can't really make a lot of adjustment for uh, people who have always been in, imp- in truly impoverished circumstances. You know, in the in the course of of figuring out how to share a master's teachings, you know, I have to decide who I can help. I have no experience with really being absolutely deprived. My uh, level of experience and my understanding is from a sort of basic functioning level, how to make what we're doing much more dynamic. I was remembering in the very early years of Ananda when we were all struggling a lot for... um, just to make Ananda survive. And Swami always had a a brilliant sense of money magnetism, and the rest of us were struggling along trying to figure it out in uh, all sorts of ways. And we we had an inclination to look toward other other teachings because prosperity was a really big sort of uh, trendy thought at that time, and there were all these prosperity teachers of one kind or another, and different people were sort of drawing in all these different ways of doing it. And I remember uh, speaking to Swamiji in that context. I said, Swami, I just can't imagine that we need to go beyond our path for something as fundamental as as prosperity itself. Master has certainly given us enough enough teachings. Swami said, yes, of course. And I said uh, said something like, what is the secret of prosperity? Swami's answer to me was very interesting. I've never forgotten it. He said, creativity. I mean, at first, prosperity is creativity. I didn't understand what he meant. But then he said very simply, creativity says, if this doesn't work, I'll try the next thing. And if that doesn't work, I'll try something else. And if that doesn't work, I'll try something else. He said, and if you just keep coming up with new solutions, eventually um, you will succeed. And Master, during the... Um, the the financial depression in America. Master came to America in 1920. So he was here through all of those very hard years. And he had the statement, if I didn't have a job, I would shake the universe until it gave me a job, which is, again, the energy that Swami was talking about putting out, just continuous energy. And in that same conversation, Swami commented that um, we would have this, we have had this annual Uh, gathering every year since 1968 or 69, Spiritual Renewal Week. And Swami commented to me, he said, when I say we're going to have 200 people, 200 guests come for our Spiritual Renewal Week, he said, I know all of you think that I'm just an unrealistic dreamer. He said, but I tell you, if I didn't affirm that we would have 200 people, we would never even have the 35 who actually do come. And I said something to him in another context about just it's sort of being a fine line because sometimes affirmations are a substitute for hard work. And so there's a kind of resistance to, and on my part, to too much affirmation because it, 
it feels ungrounded at times. And so I may just smile and say, yes, that is. That is a reality. You have to you have to walk this line exactly right. And so I was thinking about that also during those years when we were trying to become more prosperous. And Rajasi was Master's most advanced male disciple, and he was also a self-made millionaire. So it was like an interesting, there it is, and a path that is supposed to be renunciation. The Master's spiritual successor and his most advanced male disciple was a man who'd, who'd personally earned, made, created an enormous amount of wealth. So the idea that we're supposed to be impoverished yogis living in terrible conditions is contradicted right away by the presence of, of master spiritual successor, who was a millionaire. So it's a whole like um, w- different way of understanding all of this. I had mentioned just briefly in one of these earlier talks that there was a period of time in my life where Swami wanted us to move into a much nicer house, and we had to build the house in order to have it to move into. And I was just absolutely panicked that if I couldn't be poor, I couldn't be sure that I would was could be spiritual. So we have a whole lot of these different um, uh, confusions just running in our mind. Master talked about the fact that he was very devoted to to St. Francis. But he said, St. Francis loved Lady Poverty. And Master said, I'm devoted to Lady Simplicity. Now, simplicity is also not that easy a word to understand. And what I've, because Master also talks about simple living. Simple living to me for my first 10 years was living in a little trailer with no electricity and no, um, no indoor plumbing. And just owning nothing at all, absolutely nothing. I learned, it was very interesting. I had so little money. I was secure. That's that's important. That's why I realized there's a, a point here that I've never crossed over, so I don't know how to talk about it. I was secure in my place to live. I was secure in the fact that I would always have food. So I, I know that there's a level you can go below that, and perhaps in this lifetime I'll yet experience it, but I've never experienced it. So I was secure. But I had literally, like I had $50 a month, I had this opaque jar. I, opaque was important. And I put my money in that jar, and, and then I would reach in and get it out. I didn't have a bank account because I never had enough money to have a bank account for a decade. I never had a bank account. There was no reason to have one. And there was always money in that jar. I know it was a little bit magical, but that was sort of the way it was. And oddly, if I began to run short of money, I would find money like in a coat pocket or something, like a $20 bill. $20 at that time was a huge amount of money to me. So how I could ever have lost track of a $20 bill was impossible. I just presumed that Divine Mother manifested in my pocket so that I wouldn't actually be hungry or cold because I had to buy propane for that. But the fun of it was I couldn't buy anything, absolutely nothing. And it was very actually quite relaxing because there was no point ever in thinking about buying anything unless it was food or heat, because there was just simply no money. So the thought never arose. It was actually a tremendous period of freedom in that respect, because things came to me. Uh, America is a very wealthy country where I've always lived, and there's always been an excess of stuff. I've always wondered how we're going to get really poor because there's as a country because there's just so much stuff. Then, of course, I experienced a fire, a forest fire, and I've seen flood now. And, of course, war can destroy a lot. I mean, material things can be dissolved and turned into ashes in just a moment. But nonetheless, there was always, abundance was always around me in insofar as I define the concept of abundance. And so one of the things that we're, we have to think about is basically how much is enough. And how much is enough has a lot to do with our magnetism. Now, when we were in this period of time, people would talk about, oh, I was starting to say about Rajasi. That was when we created what we called Rajasi Day. And it's it, in the context of Ananda, Rajasi Day has become a, a day of community service. But it actually started as an affirmation of prosperity. That's what we were really trying to, to establish, was to put ourselves in tune with the flow of abundance. I mean, Swami supported all of this and enjoyed it and just sort of let us sort of try to find our way. And there was a lot of commentary 
about what, what people called poverty consciousness. And I, I never could quite relate to it because poverty consciousness was, it was sort of like the opposite of, of affirmation, of affirmation that I didn't necessarily, and this is just my, could be my prejudice, I didn't necessarily feel was well-grounded. It was, well, we think we're poor, and now we'll think we're rich, and so maybe we'll be rich. But it actually occurred to me somewhere in there, and, and the, the, the vast majority of people at Ananda, because self-realization is a path as overall. Self-realization is a path for people who have the capacity to succeed in the material world. And usually, I would say, have had that success in past lives and have realized that it, it does not bring the fulfillment we hoped for, and then therefore we're beginning to think about how we can transcend this material world. People who are, who are just moving through the karmic cycle of learning how to operate in the material world and how to be educated and how to be effective in a profession and are, are, are appropriately developing those kinds of disciplines and abilities tend not to be drawn to a path that says all that you're striving for is worthless anyway. It's just that it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, appear on their radar screen is something to take seriously. You have to have already been through a lot of that kind of living. And in fact, a lot of people who end up being yogis have had great wealth in the past. I remember a, a, a very small incident, but it, it stayed with me. The family I grew up in, we were quite comfortable financially. My father was um, a hardworking man, and my, uh, my mother was frugal. And you know, between the two of them, they made a very nice and comfortable home for us. But we were not materialistic. It was just not the way we were raised. And we were more utilitarian than elegant in my family. So as it happened, I, I never had fine, fine things at all. Although after my mother died, I discovered this beautiful set of china up in the closet that I think belonged to my grandmother. I never even knew it was there. I don't know. Maybe the children never saw it. Maybe my mother used it for other guests. But um, so I was. I was visiting. I was with Swami Adananda. We went to tea at a friend's house, a, a woman in the community, and she happened to have some very nice china teacups, and I picked up one of the cups, and she gave me tea in it. It was a little cup and saucer, and it was quite possible that I'd never actually had such a thing in my hand before. Not that I felt in any way deprived, it just never came to me. And I was drinking the tea, and also I had, I had somewhat of a scorn for material things. That was my, as long as I'm poor, that means I'm spiritual. So I remember just sipping the tea out of this, and I remember the, the, the very thin, China edge and the, the smooth porcelain and the very attractive pattern. And especially I remember the way it felt on my lips. And I said, oh, this is why people buy things like this. And it's really the first time I'd ever thought about it in my mid-twenties. And Swami looked at me quite like this. Be careful. He said, yogis often have been very rich in the past. You don't want to reawaken that desire in you. Now, I think he was speaking just to me, and I did take it somewhat to heart. But it was also just an interesting commentary. The fact that I'm not inclined to, do, to toward those things is a great freedom. Here I'm picking up my large utilitarian but also attractive cup. <laughs> because all the fine china cups I now own I never use. <laughs> Wait, that's not true. I have a couple of very beautiful little mugs that I use that I bought for Swamiji <laughs> because he was a king in the past and it was necessary always, I felt, to treat him like one now. So anyway, Swami put out that little bit of a warning. Be careful because you can, you can reawaken these desires. But all of that led me to realize that almost everyone at Ananda had been raised in a comfortable way without any effort on their own part. You know, it wasn't like we had to go out and hold part-time jobs to help pay the rent or anything like that. We were raised comfortable by the, by the efforts of other people. And I realized we did not have poverty consciousness. What we actually had was little rich kid consciousness. Little rich kid where money is just there. What you want is just there. What we did not understand, I think collectively, 
and this is what Swami had been trying to say, is the relationship between the energy you put out and the energy that comes back to you. And we were still just kind of looking for, for another way out of it, which is we'll just get some of these techniques and we'll do these affirmations. And what I really came to understand on a very profound level, also from watching Swamiji, Swamiji was actually very focused on earning money for Ananda. And he was always focused on earning money for Ananda. He was always writing a book and trying to, to sell it or going out on a lecture tour and trying to get a lot of people come, not to the exclusion, don't misunderstand me, of, of he was more interested in money than in service. He was tremendously interested in service. But he also knew that if he didn't focus his attention and think in terms of, of generating income for Ananda, it would not succeed. Most of the rest of us, and I put myself in that category, not all, not all of us by any means, but many of us. I'll just I'll speak of myself and many people I knew. I just wasn't thinking like that. I was serving. I had very good attitudes, but I was not engaged on the practical level in the way that Swamiji was engaged because Swamiji had learned, and he'd been forced to learn it, the relationship between hard work and income. And I began to realize, I began to see in my life that those people who were successful, I don't even just mean financially successful, but, but those people who were able to carry out an enterprise and, and bring in income through that enterprise worked really, really hard, worked very hard at doing it. A friend of mine who had to earn his way through college, and he, he arrived, he gradu he arrived at graduation debt-free. And he talked about how different his relationship to his college experience was to most of the other students, because most of the other students were being supported by someone else to go to school. And they had no idea how much one unit credit cost. And he knew exactly how much a unit of college cost. And he knew how many hours he would have to work in the summer, and just exactly what kind of job he would have to have to have that unit of credit. To him, it was not some vague mystery where you just show up and the bill is paid. The relationship between work and money was crystal clear in his mind. When we were starting our, our elementary school here, now we have we go all the way through high school, and we were sort of making a list of what do we really want these children to know when they by the time they graduate from our school. And one of the very important points was the relationship between work and money. Because we don't want to have the attitude of little rich kids where money just comes to us. We need to know. And so the... Um, um, even in our, we, now we run a, a, a tuition-based school in the Palo Alto area, so we are fortunate. We have very dynamic families, um, and the families have, to, well, we have, an, we have a scholarship program where any student who really belongs to us is able to come. But nonetheless, we have a lot of families where um, they have been very successful in, in financial terms. And our middle school teacher especially felt it was extremely important for these children to understand the relationship between work and money. But sometimes he would actually have to dispute with the parents, why should my child spend time earning money for the field trip? I can just write a check. Because the children need to understand that what they get is the relationship from the energy that they put out. So that's a very, very, very important attitude that really helps our magnetism. We don't want to be passive in this. We have to recognize that, that there's an exchange, there's a magnetic exchange here. And it, it doesn't mean that we have to be obsessed with money, but it means that we have to be willing to be very dynamic in our relationship. And this is what we're going to go into as we go through the book, in our attitudes of service, in our attitudes of creativity, just where Swami says the secret of prosperity is creativity, which is that we just keep trying. And when he was starting Ananda, he, he just kept trying. So I mean, had a very interesting, absolutely defining reality, though. Swamiji had been a monk in Self-Realization Fellowship. He'd been a monk for 14 years. Um, at the time that he was 30, when he was 36, he found himself completely on his own. He was exiled. Um, from, by, from all his friends, 
He was separated from basically every person that he knew who was important to him. He had effectively no money. He had a few hundred dollars. That's all he had. He had no possessions, no property. He was living in the spare bedroom of his parents' house. But he had given his life to serving God. Now, Swamiji is an absolute renunciate. This is not necessarily, as Swami himself said, the right way for everybody to live. But it was absolutely the right way for him to live. He felt he had given his life completely to God. His life was dedicated to serving his master's work. So now that he was outside of the monastery and outside of the support of that organization, that essential commitment of his did not change. And as the years went by, and it took a few years before he found his path in the founding of Ananda, buying property, building buildings, publishing books, you know, developing a retreat, attract, attracting all of us who were going to help make this happen, Swami never stepped outside of his service to Master. And every uh, dollar that he generated, which was hundreds of thousands, millions, I'm sure, by the end of his life. He, cre- he, he, he acquired it by spreading the teachings, writing books, singing songs, publishing albums, giving lectures, giving class series. The only thing he ever did that was not directly in that was that he actually took a job for a few months with the Peace Corps to help train young people who were going to India because he thought he could help them relate to the culture. And when I said to him, I said, sir, as far as I can tell, that's the only exception. He said, yes, but at the time I, I, I thought it was consistent. I thought I could serve master's work by introducing these people to the Sanatan Dharma, and then they would go to India with greater appreciation. It didn't turn out that way. Or he, he wasn't able in the mainstream of his work to do that. He actually did interest in an extracurricular way some of the people who were going. He said, but if I had known how it was going to work out, I would never have taken the job. So he was absolutely loyal to his first cause. And so his energy was, but he worked. It's not that he didn't work. He gave classes five nights a week and on the weekends went up to the land he was buying and gave retreats and wrote books in between. It was, he he worked. He put out tremendous energy and he didn't, um, he never thought that the universe owed him something. But he believed deeply that if he put out the right kind of creative energy, then that would create the right kind of magnetism that would bring to him what he needed. But he also, he wasn't trying to acquire money for its own sake. He was acquiring money for the sake of a flow of serviceful energy that he thought he could put forward. Now, what we get into is, let me just try to think how to say this. Um... Uh, in, well, 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 this is this is sort of like a the next chapter that we're going to talk about is what what is true security? Where does true security come from? And Swami Swami has talks in the introduction to this this first chapter of the book. He just talks about people who who never have enough, no matter how much they have, it's never enough. Because if we're trying to get our security from hoarding money, we we essentially, we know in our own hearts that there's no security there because it's just a thing. It can't provide us with a feeling. And and that very gesture, well, my friend uh, Craig Brockschmidt, Satyaki is what his name is now, he wrote a memoir about his own uh, life. And he took very early retirement from the tech industry because he got in at such a point that he became quite prosperous quite early. And when he subsequently he went back to work, I believe, if I'm representing him accurately, because he enjoyed the work. <laughs> but he, he had the phrase, which I really enjoyed, which is he realized that he had become an enough an heir. <laughs> we usually think of a billionaire or a millionaire but he realized he'd become an enough an heir. <laughs> he had enough. And so what we have to ask ourselves all the time is how much is enough? And how do we define what enough is? When I was living um, the way I was living, I had, I had food, I had heat, I had security in my community, and I had great joy in not having any responsibilities. It was more than enough. 
And I just controlled it from the side of, of what gives me inner satisfaction. And the other side of it is to always feel, as Swami puts it, he says, being prosperous is a state of mind. People can have a great deal of money and always feel anxious. People can have very little money and feel very prosperous because I have everything I ha- everything I need. And one of the, the, the magnetic keys to having the flow of energy be proper is to realize that what, what, I'm, I, what I want is to be able to live simply. And that doesn't necessarily mean in an impoverished way, but I need to just simply have what I need to be able to do what is necessary for what God has asked me to do. And, and how, much, how much that is, is not a question of what you have outside of yourself, but how you're feeling inside your heart. You know, whether it's enough. I found it very interesting. When I could buy nothing, it was very simple. Um, when I could buy some things, <laughs> that's, when it, that's when it's been very interesting. Because when you have to buy, when you can buy some things, then every desire that arises, you have to work it in relationship to what is appropriate, what is simple, what is really needed, and and what am I just? How am I trying to fulfill a different need by acquiring something material, or by hoarding money to fulfill some other lack? that I feel feel in my life. You know, what is the consciousness of poverty? What is the consciousness of abundance? And one of the principles of, of prosperity and having the right kind of magnetism is to be grateful for what you have and even more than that, to make use of what you have. You know, instead of thinking, if I had this, then everything would be different. We just look around and see what's here and what, how can I use it? And to, and to take what we have and make good use of it. You know, one of the most, I've been told, one of the biggest growth industries in the, in the USA is storage, storage areas. <laughs> because people have filled their houses and then filled their garages and then there's all this other stuff. I had the opportunity to move, to move uh, once from a house to, uh, to rented, to furnished places, and it was about a year and a half. A year and a half, in which all the boxes were in storage. And with one or two very small exceptions, I never thought about what was in those storage boxes. <laughs> and you ask yourself, you know, I have all these boxes in storage and I don't seem to miss them. Now, it was partly circumstances. Many things were provided that were in those boxes, so they were duplicates. But it's also, it's like, um, who am I? What, what is it that I want? When I was living in that little trailer, I had my mala, and I had my harmonia. And basically, those are my two. And I had my winter boots. My winter boots were very important to me. My winter boots, my rain suit, my down jacket, my harmonia, my mala. You know, like these are, this was simple living. These are the things that are needed. Now, of course, I have a whole home, and I moved into this home, and it had to be attractive for other people, you know. But it's still simple living, because everything that is part of my world contributes to my world. And that, that's what we're looking for. We, we want to have the things in our life that give us energy to live the life that God has asked us to live. And we don't want to have things in our life that are just, as they say in the, in the feng, feng, feng shui, that are just blocked chi, that are just holding, holding energy, but that energy is not flowing. You see, the Swami's whole premise about about money is that money is a flow. And if you block the flow, if you, if you hoard, if you gather, if you, if you become, you grip it like this, then the energy stops flowing and you lose the magnetism. You may think you've acquired money, but you're losing the magnetism to, attra- to attract what you need when you need it. And the stuff we have in our life and the way we relate to the stuff we have in our life is one of those very strong ways where it's it's blocked and this is um, you know this is the beginning of the of this whole series that we're going to be working with which is how much is enough and 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 am i making the best use of whatever it is that i have because it's all about magnetism money magnetism that's what we're talking about 
Okay, my friends, bless you.